so much. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about three studies I'm working on, um, and some of them have been completed, some of them are in the process, so I'm going to give you a little bit about each one of them. So first, I'm going to talk, talk to you a little bit about my theoretical frameworks, give you some overview about the way I see the world, and how everything kind of guides what I do. Then I'm going to go over the three different studies. Um, one's um, featuring talking about high school students. One's more to talk about people in the workplace, most, mostly in um, higher education and K-12 education. And then talking about some, some of the new research studies I've been doing and talking about um, college students and predominantly white institutions. And then talk about some general implications about racial microaggressions and then some of the future research and some of the engagement work that I would like to um, do. In terms of theoretical frameworks, I'm largely guided by issues of race and racial identity. So when I talk about black racial identity, I'm talking about how people, how African Americans perceive themselves and how they think other people perceive African Americans. Um, it's looking at uh, the complexity of black racial identity, it's looking at the multidimensionality of black racial identity. It's also looking at racial identity as a developmental process. And so it's something that you know, develops over time. And mostly what I've actually got it by is a theory called critical race theory that actually comes from the legal, uh, legal profession. And what critical race theory does is really is to try to dismantle um, systemic racism. It places race at the center of focus and explores the transformation of race, race, <coughs> and power. Um, and critical race theory actually has six um, basic tenets. Um, which we actually look at in some variation. Um, the first one is common storytelling. And what common storytelling enables you to do is look at those common narratives, those narratives that aren't always told. You can hear me? I'm sorry, I have a low voice. Um, with common storytelling, it's really, really telling those stories that we don't always hear. We're starting to see more common narratives now, for instance, in the news. We used to, we used to hear about this police officer and, um, and some uh, so perpetrator. And we always assume that the perpetrator deserved what they got because they were a perpetrator. But now we're hearing those common stories because we're seeing those videos and we're like, wait a minute, the, there's a lot more going on to the story. So we're hearing the common narrative of the person that and all of a sudden now we're knowing that maybe they weren't a perpetrator, maybe they weren't going on. So we're questioning that. That is common narrative. That's story common storytelling. Um, critique of liberalism actually looks at, it critiques the notion of um, Colorblindness, you know, looks at the fact that colorblindness is not a good thing. Um, living meritocracy, the fact that, you know, we don't live in a mer um, meritocracy. You know, people like to assume that, you know, they earned everything, but, you know, they forget about the fact that they got things because their cousin introduced something, or the fact that they got this job because of colonialism. Um, so it really critiques that aspect. It also looks at critiquing the notion of incremental change. The idea that, the, oh, you know, we don't need to put that pause in place. We can wait to do that. Or, oh, let's just do a piece of that instead of doing this whole big legislation. So critique of liberalism gets at all those variety of things. Um, also, whiteness is property. I'm probably going to order. Oh, premise of racism looks at um, the structural aspects of racism. It looks at how prevalent it is in society and how it, is, it looks at all aspects of society and how it is here forever. It's a systemic. And it goes back to you look at our founding fathers and how you know they structured the founding of you know, the United States of America is about white men, you know, white men landowners who were as who seemed to be the people who could rule in the country. And so really the very founding of the United States had a very racist underpinning to it. Um, the next aspect is um, whiteness is property, and whiteness is property really looks at uh, white privilege. Look at the aspect that uh, whiteness has um, value, like that of property, and that it's actually really worth something. But the, the, last, the second to last one is interest conversions, is that the only way in which um, people of color can benefit or things or laws to be passed for people of color if that interest converge for that of black people and say white people. Say, um, you know, um, <coughs> this law will only pass if you're going to get something out of it and I'm going to get something out of it. So nothing's really going to pass if it's only for the good for one group. The interests have to converge in order for, for something to get passed. So that's one aspect. And the last one is intersectionality and how we have to look at our intersecting identities. And we're really starting to see a lot more about that, particularly in the news. You can't turn on the news without hearing something about religion, sexuality. So it looks at issues of race and gender, race and sexuality, race and religion. You know, how those things kind of work together. And sometimes it's not just your race, it's about your race and intersection with another identity. And so critical race theory allows you to look at these variations and these different 
uh, in um, different aspects. And so when I look at my work, my work is actually guided by some variations of these particular theories. And so what I do in, in, in all the questions I pose, the research questions I pose, the analysis I undertake, I always usually use this kind of lens and actually write things up. So I wanted to make sure I talk to you about this so you understand when some of the data I'm actually going to present and some of the, the, the implications I'm going to give. This is the center of what I actually, this is kind of how I see things. So critical race theory, you're going to hear tennis of critical, critical race theory all through my talk. And so it brings me to the first study. The first study, um, we're looking at um, examining the social and cultural influences of the development of a scientific identity. This study was not designed to look at issues, per, per se, to look at issues of racial microaggressions. But in the process of our analyzing our data, we realized that there's really a lot of race and racial microaggressions, racial issues actually going on. So the purpose of this study really was to kind of um, get a better understanding as to why kids actually decide to um, go into STEM careers. Um, the kids in this, this study were actually in STEM academies and various schools around the um, the area. And so they all in STEM academies, so your thought is that, okay, you're in STEM academies, most likely you want to have a STEM career. So we wanted to see what kind of messages they were getting to you know, encourage them to want to be engaged in STEM. So we wanted to look at parent parental messages, teacher messages, um, the sense of career, um, science of efficacy. So we're looking at a variety of different um, constructs, like you know, constructs. And so, in doing so, we're doing a mixed method designs. So we're doing, of course, we're doing mixed method design, right? But we're doing, um, we collected the quantitative and qualitative data at the same time within one survey. And so we had three STEM academies, one racially diverse, two predominantly white. Um, we had 149 ninth and 10th graders, 40% um, white, 17% multiracial, 5% Middle Eastern, 4% black, and 11% decided not to respond. Not quite sure why they decided not to respond, but I think this is really interesting. So I'm assuming that 11% probably was mostly white. But it's really interesting. Um, so although you know, we were looking at the STEM Academy, you see most of the kids in the STEM Academy are, are white kids. Um, and so we actually, in our analysis, so we did a lot of thematic analysis, particularly for the profit of data first, because we wanted to kind of see what were some of the basic, um, some of the basic themes we were actually finding out before we actually got to our quantitative data. But once we got to, once we started analyzing the qualitative data, we saw some very interesting things that actually came about. It really made us start to question some of the other analyses that we were going to actually conduct for our study. It really made us totally kind of step back and rethink <coughs> just the purpose of our study and what we were actually doing in those schools. Um, we started asking kids about race, issues of race in their science teacher, in their science teacher, about what are some of the messages, what are some of the messages your teacher gives you about culture and science. <coughs> And these are some of the things that students said. Uh, Connor, white male, ninth grader, said, he, my science teacher, does not talk about your race, gender, or ethnicity. He takes everyone as equal, and he believes that you have the same opportunities in the field of science as the next person. This whole notion of this myth of meritocracy, that realizing that, you know, in science, women are clearly underrepresented. You know, people of color are clearly underrepresented. And there are a lot of issues with people of color and um, women in STEM. But he's clearly kind of saying, oh, we all, all have equal access, which is not the case. Um, Alice, a white male ninth grader, he, my science teacher, doesn't talk about race because it's not needed. You know, this whole idea that, you know, science is culture neutral. You know, we don't even talk about those things in the science classroom. Science, you know, it's science. You know, we don't do those things. Um, Gavin, white male ninth grader, we talk about biology, not politics and science. I mean, science is very political. I mean, you know, the whole idea of climate change, that is political. You know, the fact that you know, these kids are really seeing things as a, you know, a cultural, not political, and really not seeing the fact that culture does play a part. Now, this, so this is the climate in which you know, these STEM academies have. And these, a lot of the students are mostly in those classrooms. And so, so we, it, we began to think about, so what, what kind of community is there that are they creating, particularly for women and, and kids of color? But then we got to this next quote. This is one of my favorite ones, but when you read it, when you hear it, you don't see why. Um, Andrew White, male Tinker. All the blacks in my science class have been socially and are race mentally deficient. They don't deserve to be in this program. I see racist, but if you know these people, you will feel the same way. Their presence is required. I understand this affirmative action and all, but if they subject STEM inductees to IQ tests or something like that, they will see out all these imbeciles. Thank you. Now, this is a student. 
in this classroom. <laughs> he felt confident enough to tell us the, you know, researchers this information. So if he told, tell us, imagine what he tells the other students in the class. And imagine if you were his lab partner. Imagine the climate he has to create in this classroom. I mean, this is a huge racial microaggression here. I mean, this is something that he tells us. And so we started to really think about all the racial microaggressions that are going on in this classroom. I mean, clearly the, the, the thought, the, the fact that he thinks that black people are smart enough to be in STEM, um, only certain people are, should be allowed to be in this program, everybody should have access to it, um, it brings up a lot of different issues. So we sit right here in the high school classroom and we're seeing these things. And this wasn't the purpose of our study, we just wanted to see, okay, how they create this, this science identity. But in doing so, we really saw so much more. And, and so making us really think about what kind of racial microaggressions that kids are actually facing, particularly in STEM. And we talk about how do we get more kids into STEM, one well, of the bigger question is how do we change the climate so that kids are welcome to actually want to go into STEM. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the bigger question that we were left with. So that was study one. Um, so we're going to come, come, come back later and talk a little bit more about some um, implications that I think about where we might want to go from there. The second one. I looked at, we looked at uh, African American experiences of racial microaggressions in the workplace. And I was actually conducting with my husband, Norris Gummy, um, Jimmy, who's sitting right there. So he might jump in and might ask him to, to put in a um, So it's actually this piece, a uh, part of this piece is actually going to be published in Urban Education in the spring in a special edition about critical race theory in education. But um, <coughs> in this particular uh, study, we actually really were focusing on racial microaggressions. And when we talk about racial microaggressions, we're talking about those general soul snubs and comments that people kind of make that are meant to denigrate um, people of color because they are from a particular racial group. And when we talk about that, there are three different types. There are micro assaults, and we all know about those. That's the swastika you might see. That's the noose. That's calling somebody the N-word. And those are clear. I mean, that's, I mean we don't have to you know, argue about was that offensive or not. Everybody knows that. But those aren't the ones that we have to argue about when people are not sure about. It's the micro insults or the micro invalidations that are really kind of difficult. The micro insults are kind of when you say, and I'm like, oh, um, you know, I didn't like the, 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 um, the example that Andrew gave about, about, you know, black people not being as intelligent. That's a clear micro insult. You know, clearly, you know, he's insulting all black people not necessarily able to do well as STEM. A uh, micro invalidation is, um, is more of um, not quite acknowledging your experience uh, and kind of negating your experience. So it's kind of more tricky, the more aversive. You're not quite sure, you kind of using a micro uh, invalidation, kind of walk away saying, well, they assault me. Was that, was that a, was that a conversation you got? Not as sure, like you know, it might say, you know, well, like a kid walks into a, a gifted classroom and someone says, well, I didn't know you were in a gifted class. And so it's like, you know, you have to stop and think, so why would they think I'm not in the classroom? And, you know, so is that a comment? And so usually a micro validation kind of is one of those ones that's a little trickier, but, you know, we get them a lot, particularly people, people of color in different contexts. And then after a while, um, those little micro incidents have actually, you know, add up and they become very difficult for people to cope with. And so we really want to study, you know, what and how people actually kind of cope with and deal with those particular issues. So I did want to talk a little bit about the types of racial microaggression so we make sure that we understand when we talk about. Um, some examples of micro, um, micro insults are a description of intelligence, second class citizen, pathologizing an assumption of criminal status, and an alien and on land, colorblindness, myth and meritocracy, and denial of individual racism are all micro invalidations. But description of intelligence is basically, you know, um, basically saying, I didn't you know black people aren't smart, or black people can't do math. Uh, second class citizen basically treating one group of people lesser than other, uh, another group. Um, pathologizing cultural values, values communication styles. I mean, you see that a lot when you know, people question, say, black English, for instance, um, or question you know, um, someone's um, <coughs> use of um, uh, Spanish, um, Spanish code switching, Spanish English code switching, you know, questioning that. Assumption of criminal status. We see that a lot on campuses. You know, I remember at, uh, Urbana, in Illinois Urbana Champaign had some big articles about how black, stu black male students would often get pulled over by police, assuming they weren't students, assuming that they were there to do something criminal. Assumption of criminal status. Um, alien on land. You see a lot of that, particularly for uh, Latinos and Asians, people assuming um, they're not from here. So where are you from? I'm from Seattle. No, where are you from? You know, you know, assuming that they are foreign. 
uh, color blindness. So I did a, oh, I don't see color race, does it matter? You know, seems that doesn't have any implications. This notion of myth and meritocracy, we know, we all, I mean, we all have equal access, you know, you just have to work hard and then you can get, you know, not, not acknowledging the fact that they, you know, got things because, you know, they got a hookup from their relative. Um, and then this is one of the more hurtful ones, denial of individual racism. You know, denying that people do experience racism, denying that people um, have been hurt because of racist practices. And all of these are uh, racial microaggressions. And all of these, you know, you can experience one or all of some combination. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this room have experienced, experienced some of these. And so these are the ones we actually want to look at in our study. So this is the kind of model we want to look at how racial microaggressions impact job satisfaction. Because at the end of the day, we want to know whether or not people, do they like their jobs and how they experience the racial climate really impacts what they're doing on their jobs. And so we want to look at how uh, whether or not coping and that sense of racial identity really do, does help to maybe solve, to help to buffer or moderate that experience because the research actually talks about typically racial identity, if you have a strong sense of black identity, that can actually help to buffer your experiences of racism. So even if you're in a context, you experience a lot of racism, and you have a strong sense of black identity, that can really help you in that situation. So we really wanted to test that particular model. <coughs> so in our study, we had 113 uh, African Americans, 30 men, 83 women, uh, average age 38, 72% um, had graduate professional degrees, and I think that largely because, you know, of the just kind of who our friends or our peers were, and we got to a largely educated degree. 58% work in education, so I think largely, the, largely people in this um, study um, who driving the results of the study were educators. But when we actually pulled out the, just the educators, we got pretty much the same trend. So it really is um, educators. 81% um, had income of 60,000 or greater. So we are talking about in the middle, middle class, solid middle class um, uh, um, participants. Uh, roughly 10 years or so in, in the job market, about five years on the job. Um, so we use a variety of scales. We use a racial microaggression scale, and we looked at um, inferiority, assumptions of inferiority, and then microinvalidations. And the particular microinvalidations items we looked at were more so colorblindness. There were really issues that, um, that really got at, um, experiences of being a colorblind racism. Um, we had a, co a coping with discrimination scale, and we looked at several different aspects of coping. Education advocacy would mean, you know, if you experience a racial microaggression, you would go and educate someone about, well, that was wrong, this is what you, you know, this is why I was wrong. Um, internalization, basically you internalize all the information and kind of say, well, maybe I did something wrong, maybe it was just me, you know, I contributed to this situation. Uh, drug and alcohol use, you, you would go home and then, you know, engage in drinking, alcohol, uh, drugs. Um, resistance that, you know, you just go, res resistance and engage in sometimes, um, you would go with, I'm not going to act out, but you might go and um, fuss with your coworkers, you might get an argument, that kind of thing, very resistant. Um, and then detachment is kind of when you kind of pull away, withdraw, kind of like, I don't care, whatever happened, happened, you know, you're really not connected at all and don't, don't want to be connected at all with your community. Um, and so that's kind of looking at those at different aspects of coping. Then we also had an ethnic identity measure and then a job satisfaction scale. Then we actually had some interviews that we actually conducted as well. So once again, another mixed method study. And so I'm just going to give you some basic um, mm -hmm. and, um, results from some of the um, regressions that we actually conducted. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the preliminary qualitative data we have. Um, we actually found that a lot of the, from my, um, from my study that participants were actually really experienced a lot of detachment coping and actually inf um, inferiority microaggressions. And so um, we found that the more you experience inferiority, racial microaggression, and engage in detachment coping, the less you are satisfied with your job. And so, which is really scary because if you are experiencing these racial microaggression, you're detaching and you're withdrawing. I mean, you're no longer really connected to your community. And with severe withdrawal can actually you know, be can lead to things like depression, um, you know, on one hand, or, or this is kind of on the flip side, or it would be that you just kind of, I just go to work and I just go to work and go home. You know, I don't, I'm not connected, I don't care, I really don't want to be there, I know I don't belong, I can't change anything. And so it becomes this kind of, this automaton, you just kind of really go, you don't want to be there. And so a lot of our participants actually experience it that way. So there's a connection there. Um, when we look at just the women, it was the same thing, but instead of inferiority, it was, racial um, 
and validations is the colorblind racism. So the more they experienced aspects of colorblind racism, the more likely they were actually detaching and so and, and less job satisfaction. So once again, this whole notion of racial microaggressions, they detach from coping, they were drawing, and then you know less job satisfaction. So it's really saying something about what's going on in these contexts that you know, you know, African American people, particularly you know, since a lot of our participants are in education, particularly education or you know, higher and higher ed K twelve are you know, experiencing this. You know, so why are why are they withdrawing? Why are they having detachment coping and they are withdrawing? So they're not being connected. Uh, so my biggest concern is, you know, what are they doing? Are they are they just not connecting? You know, meaning that I just don't care anymore, and just you know, because I'm gonna find me another job, or they're not caring anymore. Me, I'm going to go to other end in terms of no, you know, health issues. And so that's a bigger question for me. Um, this is a long quote, but we actually, in further looking at the racial microaggressions, we actually um, interviewed several um, people from various industries, and some included um, people from higher education. And this one was a co community college administrator, and he talked about how um, people questioned his intelligence in, 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 in job, and they also talked about, as an African American, assuming he could only do certain things. And in his context, he talked about he was one of two full-time African-American um, employees at the community college, and the other person, yeah, yeah, two, yeah, two full-time employees, well, another one's a teacher, but everybody else were African-American males were worked with um, um, food services or lawn maintenance. And so he talked about how there are very few um, black men of color there, very few people of color, period. And so there he there. He said, he said, I was trying to work with some scholarship students to try to create an environment to celebrate those students who actually perform well academically, and I was met with resistance. Not resistance, but maybe I can sure racism. And I don't know if maybe, I like to assume that because I'm black and the students that I deal with on a normal basis, my average students are black and have an assumption that I could relate to them, understand the issues that would be more effective for them, which in my opinion is probably true to be able to relate to the population that you're dealing with. It makes it a lot easier. But when you ask me about my professional experience and my personal thoughts and feelings behind it, that discredits who I am and my ability to work with students who are primarily non-minorities who perform well academically and discredit my ability to work with those students. So he wanted to create a program to work with academically successful students who happen to be mostly white students. And they just felt, no, you can't do that. We only want you to work with the at-risk African-American students because that's the only group that you can we feel that you can actually relate to, and, um, and, and those students will only be able to relate to you because you cannot relate to the, the high achieving white students. And so he felt, he said they felt insulted, you know, because he has the ability to do a lot of different things, and he wants to do different things for the kids at his community college. So this is an example of a racial microaggression that he's experiencing. And this particular um, participant talked a lot about being, you know, feeling rejected and feeling, you know, disconnected, you know. Um, from this particular job. And so not necessarily, you know, always like in his position. He liked working with the students, but he did not like always working with his colleagues and being in that context. And so I think sometimes um, he talked about a lot of maybe wanting to leave, but he had family ties in the area, so leaving wasn't always an option. Um, so I think sometimes um, we have, we kind of stay in situations where we, because we can't leave, and I think this is a situation we can't escape. But an example of the racial, of racial microaggression, and it happened right there in his, um, his job. So the third study is really interesting. Um, we're just getting studied, getting started on this study. Um, and it's actually the study that we're actually talking about in my, in my book that, um, that I'm still working on, I haven't turned in yet. So um, my mixed method is working. This is actually a study that we're actually developing in the book. And we want to look at the experiences of African Americans to college students in predominantly white institutions. It's really interesting because we actually had this study always planned out before everything started happening in, in Missouri. And so it's really interesting. So it's right, really relevant right on time. And so we actually had our hour review. And so hopefully we can get that going because it seems like a lot of, you know, you know um, there's been a lot of impact from what's going on in Missouri. You start to see other students getting really active all over the country, which I'm really excited about. And so it's really prime and really uh, really a good time for us today. And so our goals are we want is to understand how African American students experience racial microaggressions within the college context. And so we want to look at how their racial identity influences experience the racial microaggressions. We want to look at how they cope. We want to look at how they regulate their emotions. And we also want to look at their psychological needs, particularly their needs for autonomy, 
things like that, that's very structural. And if that goes into place, that could become policy. You know, the fact that you know, people are willing to pass a constitutional amendment against LGBTQ. That's, you know, it's not racist, but, you know, that's kind of structural you know, kind of policy that has to be with systemic. They have long lasting effects. And if those are the kind of things we have to get people to fight and to address. Um, in terms of media, where I want to go next with my research um, and my in community engagement, I want to actually explore more of individuals' experiences with racial microaggressions. So, looking at adults in various contexts, we did some with um, people in the workplace, but we, want, we, we focus mostly on our high ed and, and well, the, the, the sample ended up being in more high ed and education. So, we kind of want to look at other you know, places in the tech industry or, or looking at, you know, for um, working class jobs and maybe see kind of things they're experience. There might be some differences in the different kind of jobs, you know, to the different kind of pay scales as to kind of how they can experience things. Uh, to, and how they cope. You know, coping might be very different, you know, based upon, you know, their social economic status. And so in really looking at these aspects, uh, focusing more on adolescents in school, you know, how what are they experience and how they experience the things. I think a lot of times adolescents experience a lot of things coming from peers, they experience things from teachers as well. And so how do they deal with that? How has that function? Um, so for me, yeah, so, so what do you do about it? You know, I don't want to just kind of study it. I also believe in kind of giving back. That's also an aspect of corporate theory. You critique, but also try to create change, but you also kind of give back to kind of help your community. So I would like to figure out how we educate people on racial microaggressions. Because I think a lot of people, you know, you, 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 you understand when a person calls you in work. You got that. But when people do that with other kind of shady, I'm not quite sure they insult me thing, you know, they're not quite sure how to identify those and what to do with those. And so I would like to maybe work with some of my um, work with some of my um, counseling colleagues and kind of maybe come up with some models and simulations and actually come out in the in the community and actually help people to help them to recognize what they are. And as well as teaching some more teaching some appropriate ways to kind of cope with that and to deal with those particular issues. And that would take a little while to kind of figure that out. So what would be some kind of appropriate kind of um, counseling kind of things that we can do. But that's not one of my long term goals. Um, and the next two is more so we focus more so on K-12. Um, more so to help parents to better address racial issues in schools. Because I think a lot of times our kids experience them, but you know, I think sometimes they can address it with their peers sometimes, but when they experience it when it's from their teacher, when they experience it from their administrator, it's not appropriate for um, a student to, you know, educate the teacher, educate the administrator. So that becomes a level that the parent needs to do that. And so we need to make sure that parents are taught, you know, you know, how to recognize racial microaggressions and how to have those conversations with their teachers and administrators. Because those issues can occur really fast and emotions start to rise. Anytime you talk about race, emotions get, you know, get, you know, they just violent negative emotions happen. So teach so, so helping parents better address it. So teaching teach parents the, the coping skills, teaching uh, adolescents the coping skills. And I think it's not just here, you know, not just in K-12, but in um, higher ed as well. I think a lot of kids, particularly um, our emerging adults here and um, here, here and, um, in, in, particularly in predominantly white institutions, they experience these things and they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. Um, when you're one of very few, you know, when you're a faculty member and you're one of very few, and, you know, in your institution, um, what do you do? So I think, you know, making sure people recognize and understand, helping them build communities, I think is um, kind of a better way, one of the best way to kind of address and help to help people to kind of cope and deal with racial microaggressions. And the reason I say cope with, because unfortunately racial microaggressions are not going to go away. Racism, you know, according to critical race theory, is permanent. It's not going away. So I, I, so our goal is to try to lessen it and try to deal with it and try to eradicate as much as we can. But mean, you know, but meanwhile, we still have to deal with it. So um, our goal is to kind of teach you about racial microaggressions and help you to cope with it and try to do your best to change what you can change. All right, that's what I have. <laughs>